This week it's now official, how does Governor Collier sound? They got big tax breaks to come here. Now Harley Davidson ditching KC. The president vowing to spend $1.5 trillion on infrastructure. What does it mean for our metro? He was once the most powerful politician in Jackson County. Now he's waiting to learn whether he's headed to prison. Kansas City bans the box. And is there yet another showdown over KCI? Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes. It's another remarkable week in the news on both sides of State Line. We track those stories and connect the dots on what's important with Eric Wesson, senior writer for The Call newspaper. From Fox 4 News, morning anchor Mark Alford. From the Kansas City Star, columnist and editorial writer Dave Helling. And now reporting for KCPT, KCUR, and The Pitch, wow. Barbara Shelley. Wow. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, the economy, we're told, is booming. Unemployment is way down. The stock market going through the roof. So why, with all that positive financial news, is Harley Davidson closing up shop in Kansas City? After more than 20 years here, the iconic motorcycle maker announcing it's shuttering its production plant near KCI Airport with a loss of 800 jobs. Harley-Davidson was lured here back in 1996 when Emmanuel Cleaver was still mayor. He called it a once-in-a-century catch for Kansas City. The motorcycle maker was offered millions of dollars in tax incentives to win them over. So why has Harley-Davidson decided to shut it all down now, Mark? I think it's simple economics. Sales were down like 7% nationally last year. Here locally, it wasn't that bad. Uh, Gales Harley-Davidson had a really good year, increased year to year, and some other dealerships, the same thing. But with uh, sales down, they owned about 50% of the motorcycle market in America. You've got to consolidate somehow, and that's what they're doing. This really nice plant that they have in the Northland, they're just going to have to move operations. We're going to lose the Sportster and the Softail models, which is very disappointing for Harley enthusiasts like me. Okay, and, and they're going to consolidate and move those operations to York, Pennsylvania, which sounds like a lot more expensive for labor costs than Kansas City, though, Barbara. Yeah, it does. And, you know, it's kind of curious because, as we know, Missouri just enacted a right to work law, um, which was supposed to be very business friendly and supposedly prevent this sort of thing from happening. I will say it's I'm very sad to see Harley go because um, that was for a long time a great workplace for Kansas City. I know of a couple that uh, both um, people got jobs there and they were able to leave the east side and purchase a house in Liberty and put their kids in Liberty schools. It was a ticket to the middle class. Those were great jobs for a long time. And employees didn't see this coming, Eric. No, they didn't. Uh, one of the things that is resonating is the cost of a Harley Davidson motorcycle. He was talking about how wonderful they are. Well, he but can afford one. He's a yeah, new yeah, yeah, Right. Exactly. I have a pre -owned the rest of us right. are on mopeds. 2013. <laughs> <laughs> but they're pretty expensive. I think you can get them, what, they're $30,000, $40,000? 42. 42, models, yeah. yeah. And that's pretty expensive. So I think that was what their biggest thing was with the cut in the market. And you have other ones, Kawasaki and other ones are making nice bikes. They're just not as expensive. So I think that's cut into everyday middle class people that were trying to buy motorcycles. I've hosted the show over that period of time. And so 20 years ago, I remember talking about this when it's opened. And there was the controversy at that time about the tax breaks being right. used to lure them here. But that was over 20 years ago, Dave. Has Kansas City benefited, derived enough benefit out of Holly Davidson to offset those tax breaks? Oh, well, yes. I, it's probably a break-even situation, Nick. Uh, obviously, the plant generated tax revenue for the city. I did some quick math the other day. If the average salary out there was $50,000, which sounds about right, mm -hmm. to take it all in, times 800 workers, that's a $40 million payroll. The earnings tax alone is $400,000 a year that, by the way, city, the city is losing now because of the closing of the plant. So I think probably it was a break-even situation. But it also tells you something important about all those tax breaks and incentives. They can help bring a company to a city or lose a company to another city. But ultimately, macroeconomic trends are probably more important than the incentive package that you can provide. And in Harley's case, 
the, the price of the vehicle is a problem, the shifting demographics and interest in the product, and then there was some labor strife. Uh, there, there were some changes with uh, the relationship with the union out there. You put all that together, that's probably a good explanation for what happened. But you talk about the tax incentives. That, that wasn't the only company, of course, that is making news with regards to that this week. Uh, Teva Pharmaceuticals in Overland Park announcing layoffs of one in six of their employees. The Israeli-based drug company looking to consolidate its seven U.S. locations into one main campus. So Kansas City may lose the presence of another top 100 employer. And they were making controversy just a few years ago because they were moving just from the other side of state line to come to Overland Park just a few years ago, Barbara. There you go, the border war. Um, it's a zero-sum game, as we always said. You know, those um, Teva employees, they, I, my impression is those are pretty highly skilled employees that ought to be able to find other jobs in the area if that's what they decide to do. Is that true, though, of Holly Davidson employees? Uh, you have paint mixologists who are very skilled out there. Uh, of course, putting together a motorcycle, it's not all done by robots. A lot of the Harley Davidson is handcrafted, and so you have to know what you're doing when you're building that quality of a machine. Yeah, the, the, uh, some of those jobs may end up in York. There may be some opportunity for some mm -hmm. Kansas Cityans who work there to move out there. Um, and the governor, Eric Greitens, was in Riverside Tuesday, and he told me that they're already working on helping uh, the displaced employees work on their resumes and look for other job training opportunities. But we shouldn't make no mistake, Nick, this is a blow to Kansas City. When you lose a factory that employs 800 people, uh, even though it's not one of the major employers in the city, it's still a lot of jobs. There's a trickle-down effect, fewer hamburgers, fewer housing prices. I mean, there's an impact when this many jobs leave town, and we should remember that. And it's an impact to our image. It was cool to say, we've got a Harley-Davidson plant here in Kansas City. Go take the tour. It's up by the airport. It's a great tour. I encourage people to do that before it closes. We know Kansas City has some major infrastructure issues. It might help explain why the Lewis and Clark viaduct on the Kansas side is being shut down for two years, causing massive traffic headaches, and the Buck O'Neill Bridge getting ready for a partial shutdown for emergency repairs. It's something KCPT tracked in our public works project last year. But is hope on the way? President Trump this week vowing to spend more than a trillion dollars on our crumbling bridges and highways. Tonight, I'm calling on Congress to produce a bill that generates at least $1.5 trillion for the new infrastructure investment that our country so desperately needs. We will build gleaming new roads, bridges, highways, railways, and waterways all across our land. And we will do it with American heart, American hands, and American grit. Will any of those gleaming new highways and bridges be built right here in our metropolitan area, Barbara? Well, I think the key word in what President Trump just said was, will generate uh, $1.5 trillion. He's not saying the federal government is going to offer up $1.5 billion. He's saying they will offer up, I think it's $200 billion in, in stimulus, and then states and local governments are going to have to come up with the rest of it. And that is, that is going to be a hard sell around here. Is that a hard sell, Eric? Oh, it's going to be difficult if they talk about having to raise taxes to do it. I don't know where Missouri will get the money from or where Kansas City is going to get the money for the Buck O'Neill Bridge, but it'll be doable. It's just how you're going to get the money to pay for it. A couple of things to keep in mind. $1.5 trillion, I think, is over 10 years. It's not all in one right. year. So that's $150 billion a year, uh, e even with the local match and the federal government contribution. If the, gov if the Washington comes in for 20 percent of $150 billion, that's $30 billion. That's nothing. <laughs> $30 billion spread over 50 states will not build many bridges or roads or infrastructure. That's why you're already hearing some members of Congress, and Sam Graves is critical on this, by the way, talking about the federal highway fund, maybe raising gas taxes, which have not been raised in a long time, to actually provide some real money to do some real construction, and not sort of this 10-year maybe, maybe not proposal. That we and the say. room is there now that uh, gas prices have remained Correct. low, that you can absorb another 10 
12 cents in a tax. Am I being too narrow, by the way, in my thinking by just mentioning highways and bridges? This week there's news that Missouri is now back in the running for the nation's first hyperloop for those not keeping tabs on the latest G-Wiz technology. That's Tesla founder Elon Musk's high-speed pressurized transportation tube that could have you traveling at more than 600 miles an hour, cutting a four-hour drive across Missouri to St. Louis down to less than 30 minutes. Now, this was included in Missouri's bid for Amazon. So is this not as pie in the sky as it sounds, Mark? <laughs> I think it's a pipe dream. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think it's going to happen. It's a great idea. I don't know if Missouri is going to get the project, although we've got a pretty good shot being that it's a pretty straight shot from Kansas City to St. Louis. It would be a great experimental starter line. And if I didn't have to drive to St. Louis on the interstate, I'd be a happy camper. But Hyperloop is now investing in Black and Veatch here locally to do a feasibility study on it. Right, and so it's, uh, uh, but no one, sh uh, you know, it's a possibility, Nick, but it isn't going to be, I mean, I'm getting up there. I don't think it's going to open in my <laughs> lifetime. So anyone pr uh, thinking that it provides an immediate shot to our transportation problems or the economy is probably being misled. Missouri uh, particularly needs to spend money now on its roads and bridges, which are falling apart now as your series is so eloquently shown us, and that's really what the legislature and the governor need to worry well, about. Well, back to the State of the Union, Kansas Congressman Kevin Yoder getting lots of camera love on all the networks as the president winds his way onto the House floor. Yoder is seen glad handling with Trump and flashing a big grin, and he also makes headlines when he brings as his guest the widow of the Indian engineer killed in a hate attack at Austin's Bar and Grill in Olathe. So interesting messaging from Yoder this week. What, what, what is he telling us? Well, um, I, I think a, a couple of things. First of all, he, you know, Congressman Yoder is known for good constituent service, and he, he and his office have been very supportive of the, the, the young widow um, of the man who was killed in the hate crime in Olathe. And I, I, you know, I don't think anybody can fault his gesture in inviting her to the State of the Union. That, that was a great thing to do. You know, on the other hand, he is not separating himself from President Trump and this other darker immigration message that we're sending in, you know, insulting certain other types of immigrants and, and the countries they come from. He, he's trying to play it both ways. But I'm assuming me. he views that as a positive strategy, Mark. I think so, and I think it comes down to any debate. Whoever controls and defines the term wins the debate. And I think what Yoder is doing here is that this is a woman whose family immigrated here legally. Republicans are not anti-immigration, they're anti-illegal immigration. Next up, the changing of the guard, not at Buckingham Palace, but in Topeka. How does Governor Collier sound? The loudest voices in the room don't always have the best ideas. Kansans are often underestimated, but we, we all know that if we listen and serve with humility, and strength, we will see our finest days. Overland Park plastic surgeon Jeff Collier formally taking the oath of office this week as the 47th governor of Kansas, replacing fellow Republican Sam Brownback, who's now on his way to his job protecting religious freedom around the world in his new post with the Trump administration. Does Kansas look or feel any different this week now that there's a new man in charge in Topeka? You actually spoke to Jeff Collier this week. Mark. I did yesterday. I had the opportunity with many other journalists from around the area to go have a one-on-one -on -one sit down, a 10-minute interview with the Governor Collier. He is very polished. He knows what he's doing when it comes to speaking. He hasn't said a whole lot. I couldn't pull it much out of him about his plans, but he does want to make uh, Kansas a less divisive uh, state when it comes to politics. He wants to be more transparent and provide more data on every issue so people can make informed decisions. Did we learn anything new this week? And we've talked about this quite a lot, but he makes his speech this week. He is now the governor, Dave. Right, he is. Um, uh, uh, he made a lot of uh, statements about tone in Kansas. He wants to be less divisive. He wants to seek compromise, but uh, the proof will be in the pudding. The math is still inexorable. You've got to fix schools. We said today Medicaid expansion remains an issue. He's got to pick a, uh, an issue or two. 
to show that he can actually govern. The idea that, well, I'm not going to tell you what I really think isn't going to last much longer. So we'll see. But he had a good start. No question about it. I think he reached out to journalists. He gave a good speech. Uh, the the uh, relief that Sam Brownback is now on his way was palpable yeah. in the state of Kansas. <laughs> so he had a good start, good week. But he's also and, running for office, too. Okay. you got to keep that in mind. Yeah, well, you, you see, yeah. a quick start, because he has to have a quick start, because Correct. the primary election for governor is in August, just a few months away, Eric. Right, but one of the, the selling points with me was the talk of transparency. How he's going to go about doing that is going to be something that we're going to all be watching. But it was the transparency and it was the schools. And he made one one thing that this is in Washington, he's not going to allow the government there in Kansas to be shut down as it is in Washington. So it sounds good. Whoever wrote his speech for him got <laughs> some good plugs in there, good points. Whether he'll be able to do it is another Just conversation. Just very quickly, Ed O'Malley, who was a candidate for governor on the Republican side, dropped out this week. Mm -hmm. He was considered a moderate in the field. And he dropped out largely because he couldn't raise any money. That suggests that in the primary anyway, mm -hmm. the weight is still in the Colback slash call your wing of the party and maybe not toward the center and that's that's an interesting dynamic and start looking well. for Kobach to do a lot more media especially in the state and in the region here in the metro of course living in Kansas City we have two governors to worry about on the day President Trump was preparing to deliver his State of the Union address Missouri Governor Eric Greitens was here in town touting his new tax plan we should give everybody a tax cut and that's what we're doing Speaking at a Riverside plastic manufacturing plant, Greitens claimed 97% of Missourians would see more money in their pocket. A married couple with two children earning $40,000 would see their taxes cut in half under his plan from $920 a year to less than $450. It sounds attractive. Who could be opposed to that, Eric? Nobody would be opposed to it, but in the back end, there's got to be a catch-22. It just sounds good, but uh, when you... Lower on one end has got to go up somewhere. So what else are we going to be paying for with that if, he, if, that, if his tax plan works? And where is he going to get the money for the roads, the other things that need to be done? Education is a key issue in Missouri as well. So where is that money going to come from? While he was in town, again, he was questioned by the media about the affair and allegations of blackmail. <laughs> Uh, he refuses to answer any of those questions, Mark, and says, look, I've answered those questions and you know it, members of the media. So is this now just a media question or is the, are lawmakers in, in Jefferson City also still looking at this or have they moved on? I think Dave and Barb would agree with me in that the media still has to keep asking the questions, even if he's not going to answer. We have to do our jobs and hold uh, him accountable for whatever's going on, the investigation is going on. The problem now is with the legislatures, particularly senators, who even yesterday rejected three of his nominees uh, for the Missouri Housing Commission. They said, you're not getting them. And so they feel like he is not being transparent, not communicating with them. Until that happens, there's not going to be progress. Mark raises an important point that this is broader than just the problems that mm -hmm. the governor has had in his personal life. Because the debate yesterday was astonishing. Rob Schaff, who's a Republican senator, uh, in essence said, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrase here, but almost a direct quote, Governor Greitens has left the battlefield and left three of his soldiers to die. Now, I work on the editorial board. That's a little <laughs> tough even for us, let alone someone from the governor's own party. The distrust and disagreement and anger, particularly in the Senate, is extraordinarily intense. And that's a problem for the governor not just on what he wants to say or do, but on things like tax reform. But Rob Schaff, the St. Joseph Republican, you know, really had a spat with the governor well before any of these sexual allegations even became public. Barbara. Yes, this is true, but the, the, the um, allegations of the affair just kind of put fuel on the fire and, you know, you know people see <laughs> somebody who's wounded and they, they go after him all the more. Um, yeah. I, I was, uh, but this is a problem entirely of the governor's own making. I mean, he was openly hostile and dismissive of legislators last year, so he has no one to blame but himself. This is quickly about Eric Greitens. I was at the Riverside event, had a chance to chat with him and be a part of the news conference. He does seem somewhat chastened by this event. Uh, the old Greitens wouldn't have met with reporters, might have snuck into town. I think he does understand now he de needs to do more outreach, not just to journalists, but to the public and to lawmakers. 
If that trend continues, it'll be good for Missouri. He was once the most powerful politician in Jackson County. Now, former Jackson County Executive Mike Sanders is waiting to learn whether he will go to prison just days after pleading guilty to a federal corruption charge. Mike knew better then, and he knows better now. He also knows that mistakes come with a price. He accepts responsibility for his conduct and whatever punishment comes with it. Sanders and his longtime aide Calvin Woolford used tens of thousands of dollars in campaign cash for gambling trips to Las Vegas and other personal expenses. Conspiracy to commit wire fraud is the actual legal charge that carries a maximum punishment of five years in prison and a fine of up to $250,000. But just because that's the sentence permissible, isn't it possible he won't spend a day behind bars, Eric? It's a possibility, uh, a slim one. I think once you get into, they get a little bit harder when it comes to sentencing on elected officials that, that should know better. And he did some things there and he had some things there that he probably should have knew, not only as a county executive, but as a former Jackson County prosecutor that wasn't well, kosher. Let's, let's look at the case of Steve Dennis, who was the mayor of Grandview back in 2014 when he was sentenced to a year and a day for basically the same thing. And I think that's what the federal courts will do. You got to have an example of public officials who do something wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, particularly, I must say, Nick, a prosecutor, because mm -hmm. in essence, if you go light on a prosecutor, someone who's sent hundreds of people yeah. to prison, uh, that sends a, a horrible message to the public, and I think the federal authorities know that. And I think, uh, you know, Mike Sanders probably appreciates that he he is in that kind of trouble. So we'll see what the judge. Barbara, decides. you were reporting extensively on this this week for the pitch. Yeah. It's just kind of a, a curious um, thing. I mean, the FBI spent years in Jackson County looking, looking, looking. They looked at the combat contracts. They looked at county government contracts. They finally centered on Sanders' multiple campaign funds, and there they found some things. Um, you know, I think a lot of the money that he kind of laundered money through, uh, the Star has reported on this, through a disabled man. It looked really bad. Not sure he spent so much of it on his personal personal use as he spent it to mess around in politics. It's a whole other story, Nick, but Mike Sanders loved to just mess around. Is, is there any ripple effect that continues after this? Uh, are there other people in Jackson County government that are quaking in their boots no, about well, the I possibility would say, that this may go further? Uh, not on these particular allegations, although the story continues to unfold, Nick, but Jackson County in general should be quaking in its boots because the reputation of its legislators and the executive is at a low ebb and there may be calls for reform coming because part of it is based on people who have been there for a long 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 time the Frank White uh, problems are part of that uh, Jackson County needs a scrubbing as we said in, in, in and model. I've spoken with Frank White recently and he really wants a state audit of the legislature and their spending and their contracts and some of these no bid contracts he feels like there, it, the light needs to be shown upon this, and until it is, nothing's going to be done. While some viewers may have what I'm call, would call uh, KCI fatigue, this is <laughs> the biggest project in our metro, and so we feel obligated to at least mention what's happening because it changes by the day. This week, the Black Chamber of Commerce calls on the city to end talks with Edgemore, the company they picked to finance, build, and design the new $1 billion single terminal project. Even though the pressure was on, a key council committee votes to approve the agreement with the design firm this week, but delays a final vote until next week. So what are we to make of that? Has Edgemore survived or are rival firms licking their chops ready to move in, Eric? They have survived. Uh, it's surprising, but they have su survived. One of the issues that people in the black community have is, who is the black chamber? They opened the charter again in July. We can't think of three companies that are actually in the black chamber. So why are the black chamber so adamant about this with all the other projects that are taking place in Kansas City haven't said anything? Downtown hotel, nobody's talked about what the minority participation is on that. You have uh, the trader building on Grand. They haven't met the minority participation numbers. Black chamber hasn't said anything about that. So who exactly is the black chamber? Are they just taking advantage of this because this is something that the media, the mainstream media, talks to them about who's in the black chamber. And one other thing that I want to say that's going to be interesting watching this, and I've watched this since the beginning, is Scott Wagner and his approach to conversations. I think the other day when they were talking, he asked about the labor agreement. And the labor agreement is not something that the council should be involved in. 
Then he was talking about when his wife worked for Clarkson and she got fired. He ran to the store talking to them about it. So where is, should he be like excluded from conversations mm -hmm. with this? Because it's becoming more evident that he's a conflict of interest. So, Dave, you know, the bottom line ultimatum here on this, I mean, so next week when the council meets, it's still looking now that they will approve Edgemore, and this, we can put this saga behind us. Yeah, we have, the, you need seven votes to approve it. There are four solid, maybe a fifth. Yesterday, Councilwoman Kennedy said she's for the deal. That's an important uh, announcement. Uh, that gets you closer to six. And Dan Fowler, Fowler uh, might be the seventh, and I was told this week by a council member that if they can get to seven votes, they think they can get to nine or ten because people will want to get on the bandwagon. So in the last 72 hours, Nick, there has been a decided move toward the Edgemore deal, in part because of the uh, adjustments to the agreement that Edgemore agreed to, but mostly because council members are terrified that if they blow this deal up, you've got another six to eight months to worry about. But, but and who, no one who wants could to have through imagined this all of this <laughs> taking place, though, Mark, right? Right after a majorly landslide vote back That's in November. The point. That's the point. That is the point, Dave. And you're, you're right on target. The pro Here's the sad thing, though. It's like, okay, we've got to get this done deal done, and we don't really care who it's with. Let's just get it done, or we're, we're not going to have a new airport. Is that the way we should be spending taxpayer dollars? Yeah, I, I, let me just quickly say you would delay it probably for a year if you don't do Edgemore. And Edgemore was picked before the election. Now, that probably was a mistake because, uh, because you could have gone through a, b a better process if you had exactly. waited. But the idea was we want a developer to take to voters, and that's why voters approved it by a three to one margin. Well, so what I if we wait a year and a half? Let's do it right. Well, uh, we, we don't want to be flying out of KCI at a new airport in 2030, though, do <laughs> yeah. we, Eric? No, we don't. Yeah. And the I'm airlines gonna aren't going to put up with it. it. They just aren't. All righty. Yeah. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers from The Call, Eric Wesson, and from The Star, Dave Helling, reporting for KCPT, KCUR on the pitch, Barbara Shelley, and from the Fox 4 News morning team anchor, Mark Alford. Next week, we lift up the hood, raise the roof on evictions in Kansas City in a special hour-long edition of the program. Until then, I'm Nick Haynes. From all of us here at KCPT, thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.